Hey there. It's July of 2015 and welcome to this edition of Take 5 with Tony. Today we're going to talk about another false choice and this is a big one. It's either genetically modified foods or world hunger. You might have heard this. I've, I know I've heard it a lot from pundits and others. In fact, over the last couple of months, I've heard it from a couple of my elected representatives. I, I had written them, both a Democrat and a Republican, expressing support for labeling laws that would allow consumers to know when foods have genetically modified ingredients. Both wrote back expressing some concerns about GMOs, but their bottom line was almost identical. They felt we had to consider using GMOs because we have to be able to fight world hunger. So see, this is the underlying notion, this is the foundation of the argument for GMO foods, that they yield much more than traditionally bred varieties, and as a result, they offer hope for solving world hunger. This is what we've been hearing. Now, in future segments, I'm going to talk about many other issues and the science related to GMOs, but let's focus now on this question of yield. GMO crops have been commercially available for a little over 20 years, They've been in research and development for well over three decades. And during that time, there's been one single trait that has dominated all of the genetic modification work, and it has been herbicide resistance. You might have heard of Roundup Ready corn or soybeans. This has been the primary trait that folks have worked on in, in GMO crops. So much so that Roundup Ready corn and soybean seed varieties now constitute over 90% of all the soybeans and nearly 90% of all the commercial corn planted in the United States. What about yield increases, though? Well, two studies shed light on this. One is from the Union of Concerned Scientists, the other from Washington State University. Both of them found that over all of this period of time, 20 plus years, the increase in yield is marginal at best. In fact, in some years, They've seen slightly higher yields with GMO varieties compared with traditionally bred hybrids. In other years, slightly less. The Washington State study, it looked at 20 years of trials from 1990 to 2010, and they found that overall, the yield on average from GMO varieties was about 3% more than traditional varieties. 3%, that's about six bushels of corn per acre. Now, what a farmers have to do to get those additional six bushels per acre? First of all, they spend much more on seeds. GMO seeds cost between 65% and 100% more double what the cost is for hybrid seeds that farmers would use that are nearly as productive. And they've had to apply a lot more herbicide. So far in the two decades of GMO crops, we've seen about 500 million pounds of additional herbicides used in American corn and soybean and other fields as a result of these GMO crops. So to date, very small increases in yield. But proponents of genetically modified foods say that they're working on drought tolerance, that soon they'll have drought tolerant varieties that will allow farmers, especially in poorer countries, to be able to bring the crops in no matter how severe the conditions. While we do know that people using traditional breeding methods, both open pollinated and hybrids, have been able to increase drought tolerance of a number of different varieties. But in more than three decades of research, development, and commercialization of GMO crops, there has not yet been a single crop released that shows drought tolerance. It turns out it's a lot more complicated to breed that in through genetic modification than is herbicide resistance. There is a w another way to get drought tolerance and that is building soil organic matter. A 2012 study from Nature Magazine found that the single best way to increase the drought tolerance of all kinds of crops was to increase organic matter through cover cropping, manures, legumes, and minimize tillage. The very practices that sustainable and organic farmers commonly use and that are quite uncommon on large monoculture farms using GMO varieties. So the next time you hear an expert or a pundit or a politician tell you, we've got to have GMOs to fight world hunger, tell them it's a false choice and we're not willing to make it. Thanks a lot and see you next time. We've heard over and over again that we need genetic engineering to feed the world, that it's going to dramatically increase yields in a time of growing population and hunger. We just saw in our first episode that actually after more than 20 years and 
billions of dollars of investment, GMO crops are no more productive than traditional hybrids. In our next segment, we'll begin to look at the question of, is genetic engineering just like every other kind of breeding? Stay tuned. Hello, and welcome to this edition of Take 5 with Tony. Well, another really important point that folks who promote genetically modified foods make is that they say that you don't have to worry about the safety of the foods because actually the genetic modification process, it's just like a continuation of what farmers and scientists have been doing for millennium. They've been trading genetic material among plants and there's nothing significantly different between genetic modification and other forms of breeding. In fact, not long ago the National Academy of Sciences said that there was no conceptual difference between genetic modification and other forms of breeding. Well, what does traditional breeding entail? Well, you have farmers who save seeds through open pollination of bees and other pollinators, and more recently, in the last 50 years, has been the growth of hybrids. Now, hybrid is a little bit different from open pollination, but a hybrid still involves the reproductive parts of a plant. It still involves exchanging pollen between a male flower and a female flower. And in the case of a hybrid, it's done carefully to select for certain traits from one type of plant to another. Now, what about genetic engineering and genetically modified plants? Is that also about the same? Well, you'll hear proponents say that actually it's more precise and safer than traditional breeding methods like hybridization. And they'll talk about gene splicing. And when you hear gene splicing, you probably think of a very precise process of moving tissue from one species to another. Let's look at that. Watermelons are wonderfully sweet, but they only last a couple of weeks in storage. What if you wanted to get much longer storage and you, just, you found the trait in a potato that you wanted to take out of the potato, put into the watermelon, so you have a sweet watermelon that lasts months instead of a couple of weeks? Here's what we think genetic engineering is. A splice of tissue from the potato, isolating the gene, and a splice into the recipient, the watermelon, to receive that tissue. That's at least the notion we have of gene splicing and its precision. In truth, the process of entering genes from one species to another in genetic engineering is more like this. Put the tissue into the chamber, lock it up, that's genetic engineering, honest. A gene gun is used to insert the material from one foreign species into another recipient species. In fact, in the early days of genetic engineering, they actually used a 22 caliber gun. Now they're a little more finessed, but it's still a gun that is powered by air that fires the genetic material into the other organism. Now let's talk about why they do that. First of all, with genetic engineering, remember that you're taking samples and tissue and genetic material from completely unrelated species, not two types of squash or two types of cucumber, but from things that have no relation in nature. Now, the species that's getting that genetic material, it either doesn't recognize it, or it tries to fight it off as it does any invader. So not only do they shoot the material into the tissue, but they have to add a promoter, an unnatural promoter, and they use a virus. So you have three or four completely foreign genes packaged together in what the scientists called a cassette and then propelled by force randomly into the recipient material. That is the truth of what the genetic engineering process looks like in practice. Given that, it's not at all surprising that unexpected occurrences, mutations, viral responses, essentially allergic responses, have been detected in the recipient organism, but also in some of the animals and people consuming these materials. Because when you invade an organism with viruses and antibiotics and lots of sheer force, it's only expected that you would get lots of disturbances and, and changes that are above and beyond the particular trait you are trying to instill. 
the notion that genetic engineering is simply a continuation of millennial process of manipulating different varieties is such a great misrepresentation that I think we could fairly call it a lie. Thank you, and we'll see you next time. I was with some folks just last week, and I heard it again. Genetic engineering, it's no different from other kinds of breeding. Well, I think we shot some holes in that theory with our last segment. It simply isn't true. So in our third segment, we'll look at another profoundly pervasive GMO myth, and that is that there's never been any evidence of health, safety, or environmental problems. Hello, and welcome to Take 5 with Tony. This is the third in our series about genetic engineering. GMO foods are perfectly safe. There's never been a documented case of anyone becoming sick from eating genetically modified foods. And there's not been a single reputable scientific study that shows a connection between GMO consumption and health problems of any kind. That's what Monsanto says. That's what Syngenta and Bayer say. That's what all the promoters say. But a fair number of microbiologists and spokespeople for distinguished scientific organizations have said as much as well. So it's pretty persuasive. I guess the fact is that there's just no evidence of any kind that GMOs could cause health problems. Oh, except a study by Dr. Eric Seralini who looked at GMO corn, Roundup Ready corn, fed to laboratory animals and found, in fact, very serious problems with their livers and kidneys. And on top of that, after a few months, extensive development of tumors and higher rates of mortality compared to the controls. Okay, except for the study by Seralini, there's never been a case, evidence of any kind, proving problems with health and GMO consumption. Except for the CalGene Flavor Saver tomato, the first on the market, and CalGene's own data showed that the rats eating the tomatoes, 20% of them developed serious stomach lesions. Okay, except for the Seralini study and the CalGene Flavor Saver tomato, there's no evidence ever of any health problems with GMO food consumption, except the Rowett Institute, prestigious institute in Aberdeen, Scotland, and the work of Dr. Arpud Pustai, who took potatoes, fed them to laboratory animals, and found incredible abnormalities in the intestinal tract, along with serious deficiencies in the immune system. All right, well, except for the Seralini study on corn and, and the Rowett study on potatoes and the Flavor Saver study on tomatoes, there's no evidence that GMOs have ever caused any health problems, except the GMO soybeans tested by Dr. Manuel Malatesta, who found that the soybeans fed to mice led to kidney problems and problems in the endocrine system, as well as problems in the reproductive functioning of the males. Ooh. So we hear that there's no evidence ever anywhere of any kind, but you know what? There is. And these are not quacks. These are PhDs and reputable scientists performing the research under excellent controlled circumstances and having it peer reviewed and published in the finest journals in the world. That's where the evidence is coming from. Now, what are the differences between these studies and the studies paid for by industry? The industry studies tend to be 90 days or less. And what these scientists have found is that many of the problems with kidneys, livers, stomach, intestines, autoimmune, only accumulate after many more months, sometimes six months, 12 months, 15 months. Now in people, that's equivalent to 10, 15, 20 years. And here's what's interesting. As people have begun to look at this, they're in fact seeing correlations since the rise in the consumption of GMO foods and all kinds of problems, including serious kidney problems. Crohn's disease and other inflammatory bowel diseases, even autism. None of that has been proven, but there are strong correlations now. So I got to thinking, maybe it just takes a long time for the evidence to accumulate. Maybe we just don't know because these kinds of problems materialize only after years and years of consumption. And I started wondering, has there been anything else we've consumed that it took us quite a few years to figure out there were problems, and quite a few years for them to accumulate? Could be.
I don't know. See you next time where we'll conclude our four-part series on genetic engineering and GMO foods. Thanks. So we've seen many studies, peer-reviewed studies, that show much reason for concern with the health and safety of genetically engineered crops. What's more, just recently, a USDA study showed profound transmittance of GMO Roundup Ready genes from GMO alfalfa to wild alfalfa. That shows that on an environmental scale, this could be very, very dangerous. In our fourth segment, we're going to look at what you can do to begin to change this debate. Thanks. Hello and welcome to this edition of Take 5 with Tony. This is our fourth and final in the series we've been doing on genetic engineering and GMO foods. As this segment winds up, I'm going to be encouraging you to get involved and take some action. But the first action I want you to take is to read this book. Go out and buy and read this book by Stephen M. Drucker, Altered Genes, Twisted Truths. This is by far the most comprehensive, thorough, and painstakingly documented book on every element of genetic modification and the GMO enterprise. It's really one not to be missed. So let's talk about this question of labeling. The US House of Representatives has recently passed a bill that some folks are calling the Dark Act, H.R. 1599, which makes completely illegal any labeling laws at any level uh, regarding GMO foods. States can no longer label GMO foods. In fact, those states that already passed GMO labeling laws, they would be nullified. And even further, cities, counties, and states can pass no type of law or ordinance at all that would in any way limit the production of GMO crops. It's quite extraordinary. This is going to be considered by the U.S. Senate in just a matter of weeks in September of this year. Now, the justification for this anti-labeling movement is threefold. First is this idea that genetic engineering is just like any other form of breeding, no different from traditional breeding methods, from hybridization. So the foods we get are the same. They're equivalent. Well, you remember the discussion of that point and how completely false that is. Secondly is the idea of food safety and the statements over and over that there's no evidence anywhere at any time of problems related to genetic engineering and human health, or even genetic engineering and the health of laboratory animals. Well, again, we've seen that not only is there some evidence, there's quite a bit of evidence in authoritative peer-reviewed journals, but that every single time a study shows a strong connection between GMO consumption and serious health problems, the study and its authors are attacked, they're vilified, they're dismissed, as junk science. So much so that the argument becomes unwinnable. There's no evidence of GMO foods and health problems, but when there is evidence, we simply ignore it. That's a catch-22 in the classic sense. And then the last thing. We opened our series with a discussion of GMO crops and yields. And you'll recall that the evidence is quite clear. GMO crops of corn, soybeans, and other things yield at best marginally, slightly more than what traditional hybrids and crops can use. So it isn't true that GMO methods are the same as traditional breeding, not at all. It isn't true that there's no evidence at all of problems of health and illness relating from GMO consumption. And it certainly isn't true that we must have GMO crops in order to fight world hunger and feed the world. All of those, the entire foundation of the argument against knowing what's in our food against labeling GMO crops is completely false. So I encourage you, again, to get Stephen Drucker's book. But even before you do that, to write to your senator, to speak out to your elected representatives to say, I've done my homework on GMO foods. We don't need them for world hunger. They're probably not good for us and they're certainly not equivalent to tra traditionally bred crops. We need labeling laws, and the United States Congress should support our right to know what's in foods. Thanks, and I hope this short series on GMO crops has been helpful to you. Take care, and we'll see you next time.
We now know that genetic engineering is fundamentally different from other traditional breeding, that GMO crops have not increased yield significantly and are not fighting world hunger, and that there's plenty of reasons to be concerned about their safety and their environmental consequences. In our final segment, we'll wrap it up by looking at how our agriculture and bioengineering policy so closely tracks with our so-called trade policy. Hope you'll stay with us. Thank you. Hello and welcome to this edition of Take 5 with Tony on this beautiful October day in Southwest Virginia. Twenty years ago, Bill Clinton signed into law NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. About that same time, the first genetically engineered food crops started to enter our food system and marketplaces. Now over the past 20 years, although our food and ag policy and our so-called trade policy have got many differences in their details, much about them has also overlapped, and they've both had profound and far-reaching consequences on our economy, our communities, and our workers. As I've looked at them more and more, I've started to see this overlap in four particular areas that I'm going to talk about. And, and when I look at it all together, it seems to me that they come together in what I'm calling Roundup Ready Trade Policy. Now, first of all, both the ag and biotech policy and our foreign trade policy take a scorched earth approach where collateral damage is just, well, something you've got to live with. In the case of our genetically engineered crops, nearly three-fourths of all the acreage of GMO crops includes herbicide resistance or Roundup-ready crops. And, and the consequences of that have been profound, not only in reducing the biodiversity on farms and increasing tremendously the dependence on herbicides, but also in profound impacts on soil microbiology, on the, on the microbes that we need to keep our farms and our food healthy. In a similar way, our trade policy has led to destruction of many, many downtowns. Uh, the collateral damage is being businesses and manufacturers whose work has gone overseas, small businesses and, and whole communities where the downtown center is boarded up and people flee from other opportunities. It's a scorched earth collateral damage approach. Secondly, we've seen a favoring of the big monoculture approach over the small and diverse approach. Again, with genetically engineered seeds costing nearly twice as much, and with the margins being more slim, farmers tend to plant just one crop on huge acreage, thousands of acres. And that monoculture approach hurts not only the health of the farm ecosystem, but makes the farmer more vulnerable to commodity prices for their corn or soybeans as opposed to a diversified small farm that not only has more ecological systems in balance, but has less risk for the farmer as they have more eggs in their basket. Our trade policy has done the same thing. We've relied on a handful of huge international corporations, both in manufacturing but especially in retail trade and banking. And those have been favored tremendously over the small and mid-sized businesses, the local and the independent, the cooperatively owned, all of which contribute more to the health of local economy. Third, when, when things have gone wrong, when they've gone south, rather than reflect and maybe change course, in both our ag and trade policy, we've doubled down and doubled up. What have we done when we found herbicide resistance on more than half of all the farms in our country, super weeds emerging as a result of too much herbicide? Instead of changing course, we're now looking at genetically engineered crops that have resistance not only to Roundup, but to 2,4-D, dicamba, and other more toxic herbicides. And similarly, in our trade policy, when we've seen what these investor settlement dispute mechanisms have done, favoring big corporations over health and well-being of communities, rather than change that, current trade negotiations like the TPP only strengthen those mechanisms in favor of big corporations, just like they strengthen the patents that favor those big guys at the top. And lastly, on top of all of that, both of them favor secrecy over transparency. With GMO crops, the big ag players are all fighting for labeling, even though nearly 90% of Americans, Democrats and Republicans, conservatives and liberals, say they want to know if their food has genetically engineered ingredients. And yet they fight tooth and nail state labeling and federal labeling laws. Similarly, our trade agreements, they were conducted in relative secrecy back in Bill Clinton's day right through to George Bush, but 
Even more so, the current round of trade agreements have been conducted in almost complete secrecy. Why? Why is that justified? And so you see we have two different strands, two very important sets of policies, one about agriculture and food, the other about trade, and yet they seem to come together in an overlap, an unhealthy overlap that I call Roundup Ready Trade Policy. I think we can change that, but it's going to take both ag advocates and trade advocates working together. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.